Hi, everybody, and welcome to Be in the Know, Table Games and More. I'm your host, Benny Mancino, sometimes referred to as the B-Man. And it's m my pleasure today to go over a topic that's really been kind of hitting the news scenes for uh, the last uh, oh, several months in, in different formats. But we're going to talk about roulette cheating. And who else would I go to to help me with this, this episode? None other than the greatest roulette cheat of all time i mean bar none i mean it's, there, there's no you know there's no there's no debate on this richard richard marcus welcome to be in the know very great to be with you again so so richard you know the the big hot topic has been this 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 guy sean joseph benward and i've known i've known of sean at least a decade and maybe maybe the guy's been going uh Further. Let me give you my history, what I know about this guy, and now I want to get your opinion on how, how he's been able to evade uh, uh, prosecution and stuff like that for, for so long. So now if we uh, if we go and we look at uh, when, when he first started out, he was just a, actually a shot taker. You know, it was it was a shot and he would have somebody confirm the shot and then he involved it into the social engineering that it is now. So to give the audience a, a, a kind of a background on how the how the scam works, he'll come in and he'll make friends with the uh, floor supervisor. He'll make friends with the, the 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 dealer. He'll start token for the dealer right off the bat. He'll place some mile bets in quarters around around the layout, and then here comes the big stacks, one hundred fifty dollars, boom, 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 all, all over the layout. Now if he hits, all well and good. If he don't hit, he'll say. You know, oh my God, I told you to put this on the four for me, you know. And now the dealer's thinking, well, this guy's a nice guy. You know, he he's been tipping me and everything. And and uh did he say, did he say the eight or the four? What what did he say, right? Now the floor supervisor, he's had a good experience with the guy. He thinks he's okay. And now guess what, Richard? Some totally different demographic down at the other end of the roulette table. What do you think they say? That's what he said. Yeah, he said, put it on the eight for me or wh whatever the number was. So he's got this on, this scam, this amazing scam for, for years upon years upon years. Doesn't matter if, uh, you know, uh, there's there's news uh, broadcast, if it comes over Biometrica, just kept going and going and going and going. Well, recently he, he did the uh, move in Indiana and then he came back and tried to do it one more time. And that was maybe one time too many. But give me a give me your opinion on a cheat like this and how how they were able to go so long. Lots of lots of reasons, Benny. Uh, primarily, it's a, a deficiency in the in the game protection industry concerning the people on the floor who are supposed to be the first defense uh, of game protection. Uh, you know, I always say that if the, if the table games people aren't aware, if they don't know what's going on as far as cheating goes, surveillance can't really help that much because in real time, you know, they're not going to catch much. But you mentioned something uh, very key. I think it was the first thing you actually said when you were describing the actual move is they come to the table right away or, or he comes to the table right away and starts talking the dealer. Uh, that is, you know, it's, I guess it's a form of, of social engineering, you know, back in the day when I was cheating, uh, what I call what, what's called social engineering today, I called a setup and, uh, we would set up, you know, we would come to a, a roulette table and we, the first thing we would do is have the claimer, the person who was going to take the money off the table, start tipping the dealer even before he made a bet. Uh, this, like, you know, like you say, you know, this is always a friendly guy and he's tips. And then uh, we would have the, the, the claimer make a series of bets. You know, in our case, it was a uh, hundred dollar bets straight up because uh, we were setting up past posts for $102 straight up, you know, for $3,500 and $7,000 payoffs. So our claimer would come to the table right away and he would start spreading hundred dollar chips straight up on the number. As he's betting, talking the dealer, chatting everybody up, giving compliments to the dealer. For If it was a woman, oh, I love your dress. Uh, if it was a guy, he would start talking about the local sports team or, you know, just start a conversation, draw the attention 
uh, to himself. But the key was the, the, he was setting him, himself in the minds of the of the dealer and the supervisor or whoever else was around the table, including the other players, that he was A, a high roller, and, and B, a, a George, a, a generous tipper. So that that's the first thing, uh, that, that form of social engineering. The second thing is, you know, when you look at the move itself, it, it's so rinky-dink. It, it's so ridiculous. And then again... You know, the, the I learned uh, when I got involved in game protection, you know, I learned something that I never knew uh, while I was cheating. And had I known this, you know, I, I, I can't even count how much money I, I would have made. I don't want to sound the uh, braggadocio here, but, uh, you know, this is the truth. I when 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 we designed moves, you know, back in the day, uh, I thought, you know, we designed moves. They were choreographed. They were elaborate they were really really well thought out with intense use of psychology and, and and then we spent ages you know months and months years practicing and you know everything had to be perfect you know today when you know what what i learned when i first got in, in involved in game protection and i first had contact with uh surveillance directors and you know and people who you know, know the most about in, in the industry who know the most about game protection and cheating. And my very first time meeting uh, these people and talking to them, I, I was flabbergasted by how little they actually knew about cheating. And, and you know, this is not to put anybody down. And, and fortunately, it's changed today. It's not nearly a, a, as bad or deficient uh, as, a, as it was back then. And I like to think that, uh, you know, my book, American Roulette, and, and some of my articles have at least helped to some degree make the game protection industry as a whole understand uh, what cheating is, especially on a professional level, what it's all about. But, you, you know, you, you, you look at the move and you say to yourself, you know, he went to the well one too many times. How did he, how did he even get paid the first five times? You know, somebody says, you know, bets, uh, you know, throws, throws uh, some chips toward the dealer and says, uh, yeah, uh, put these six chips on uh, on number six, right? Put these six chips on number and, and number four comes in. And then he says, no, I, I meant I said six chips on number four. And then the the, the person, his, uh, his associate up front, you know, probably a, a pretty girl or somebody like that who's been flirting with the dealer. And, and she says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he said uh, number four or whatever, you know, whatever the the actual uh, mistake uh, he's claiming that the dealer made. And, and you know, how, how did that, how did they get away with it time and again? You know, it's it's mind boggling. But, you know, as I learned starting from my early days in game protection, that it seems the, the, the kiss, keep it simple, stupid. It, it seems like these kiss moves are the ones that work the best. And, you know, I wasted all that time thinking and devising and, and and coming up with these really sophisticated moves when you know all you had to do like you said is, is just take shots at the casino and and getting back to the the, the uh the floor people and the people and uh, you know the table games people on the floor uh you know there's a lot of reasons uh you know how many of them really care you know it's a job how many you know they get a you know they get a a message or you know the, or the, there's an alert out you know watch out for this particular scam and then it happens and, and uh, they you know they forgot it they don't put it together or you know you know you know i don't know you know what the percentage of table games directors or or right down to dealers you know i don't know how many of them you know really care uh, you know in, in a lot of cases it's it's just the job so you know there's a combination of things and uh you know you know uh the move, you know, all I can say is the move is rank. Uh, you know, if if like, I believe you have uh, caught this move several times, or people you have taught have caught this move several times. I mean, if people want to, you know, people if casino personnel want to stop a move like this, it's 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 very easy. But then again, you know, how how hard is it to stop uh, dice sliding? You know, it, that was probably the most publicized move for, for six or seven years. And it's, uh, it's an, you know, 
the, the two dice have to hit the back wall. They have to be thrown at the, at the same at the same time, and they have to tumble and not spin. I mean, how hard is that, right? But it, it just keeps happening. So it, it's all those reasons, man. It's uh, it, it does amaze me, and and I think a a lot of it's the culture, like you said, people just don't don't care as much. You know, when I was learning my craft, I couldn't wait to learn the next. You know, if I see a dealer, you know, able to cut checks a certain way, I wanted to learn that, right? And I wanted if a if a table director was using some sort of new technology or or procedure to to help his uh, operation, I I wanted to learn that. I, I don't think I don't think you have that desire, and people don't keep up on on daily activities. Now, like you said, the group I kind of my inner circle of directors or something I hang out with, we're all kind of uh, junkies like like myself but that's not that's not the norm it's not the norm and within that group you know 11 times there were shots taken by sean eight times they were caught and and not paid so that that's that's pretty good percentage i i, I guess i mean still you think it might be in 100 percent. but it's uh what really kind of amazes me too though is with all the technology and the biometric uh, and all this stuff we have which wasn't around when you when you were cheating uh richard and still, and still, this this keeps going on, uh, you know. And it's it's it goes beyond Sean. You know, there's some other guys coming up with these moves. One of the greatest ones it was told in your your game protection, and I was told uh, I heard it uh, it uh, just happened again recently. It's the one where the guy's at the top of the wheel head. He throws a five hundred dollar chip on red, right. And now he's got a guy he's talking to and he gets into this conversation with a guy and he's not even looking at the layout. The woman comes up, puts a couple of her dollar chips on top of his his $500 chip and now moves it to black because she changed her mind on what she wanted to bet. Now it hits red and he goes, where's my $500 chip? And the woman goes, who is his accomplice? Oh my God, I accidentally moved it. And guess what? He gets paid 100% of the time. It's not one percent of the time the guy can't lose, and it's just it just keeps going and going and going and going. Uh, just recently, now this was on electronic roulette, which you you've talked in in in, in detail about attacking these games. Uh, one of these uh, uh, people figured out the flaw with uh, uh, probably combination of a, a, the collusion of the dealer and the player that if you spun the ball the wrong way on inner block, of course, it, it, it issues an error. Now this supervisor who has to walk probably 40, 50 feet or maybe at 50 yards to come over here and, you know, uh, the dealer says, hey, it should have been in 14. It, you know, it accidentally, it, look, it tilted. And he comes over, he swipes the supervisor card and goes on with life. He don't even even ask for a surveillance review or anything. He just pays out. This is Rivers Pittsburgh. It was uh, in the news. I think the group was uh, six, five, six people now that they're seeing was involved in this whole scam. So if there's an opportunity, I guess people are going to uh, take advantage of it. But it's just uh, it's just amazing that it keeps continuing. You know what? Um, there there's another aspect to this. Um, I have found over the years, you know, doing game protection seminars and training and all that, that a lot of people, even, you know, even high up people in game protection, you know, surveillance directors and, and people who really, you know, are supposed to know everything that's going on. And a lot of them, they don't believe uh, that they can be cheated in, in most ways that they can be cheated. It'll but never happen to them. Um, what what I what I always say one of the first things I always say uh, when I do training and, and I can't stress it enough is you have to believe the unbelievable your mind has to be open and you you have to leave your ego at home and and your mind has to be open about you know you know like I explain. I explain, you know, moves I've done, you know, back in the day that I've done a thousand times, like like the Savannah move. And, and, you know, people will look at me and say, you know, that's impossible. Nobody could do that. And, and, and you know, I did it a thousand times. And uh, a, a great example of that is uh, I was filming uh, 
right in Atlantic City at the at the old Taj Mahal, we were filming a segment uh, for a TV show on the Savannah, and the dealer who who they they gave us a deal or the Taj Mahal gave us a dealer and when I was in the business you know we kept records like any other corporation any business on every move that we ever did you know who the dealer was who the pit boss was was there heat what surveillance called everything and I recognized the dealer and this and this happened you know uh maybe this happened like in 2006 so I, I had already been retired for six years and the dealer was an old timer and I recognized the dealer immediately. And I knew immediately that we didn't beat him with that move one time. We beat him with that move three times. And as we're doing, as we're filming it, he, he's watching it. I'm explaining the Savannah to the, to the journalists, right. And the TV crew. And he's shaking his head like this. And he, and he actually said, no way that would ever work on me. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah, I wanted to say, buddy, it worked on you three times, uh, you know, but the, but this is, you know, you know, so that's the first thing, you know, be aware of the and if you look at that Savannah move, which, you know, a lot of people will say it's the best casino move ever created. If you look at it, it's so simple. It, it's so ridiculous. Yeah. You know, you, know, you, you bet you bet five thousand dollars in a column or uh, or a or a uh, dozen box bet. And if you win, you get paid. If you lose, you just take it back and you switch $10 in because the dealer never saw the $5,000 chip underneath. And if you get caught, you say, oh, I'm drunk. Uh, uh, you know, I didn't know the ball dropped. And then nobody's calling surveillance over $10 because when the move, when the, when the, uh, when the bet wins, they call, that's when they call surveillance and it's a legitimate bet. And, and these moves are so simple and, and nobody, you know, people either believe, you know, they, they can't happen, you know, or they, you know, they depend too much on the, uh, like you mentioned, the high technology now and the equipment, they depend on that all the time. So they just, they just think their back is covered by the, by the, by the equipment, by the cameras. And, uh, you know, it, it's a, a multi-factor thing. So, you know, what it comes down to, you know, how do you stop this? You know, it, it, it comes down to, you know, not only training, you know, it, it, you need in-house training, you need out, outside training, uh, with outside consultants and then you need to make sure that the training filters down to the dealers all the way down to the dealers uh, i have of all the game protection training seminars i have done maybe five percent of them had dealers in attendance and who's the most who's the most important person that really needs to know all this it's the dealers right because oh, yeah. the the uh, yeah, you know what you 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 nailed it on the head when you talking about you know this uh, protection starts at the floor supervisor level, but you know I've consulted uh, several properties in over the last decade, and you know everybody uses surveillance as a crutch. Surveillance does all the work, and uh, surveillance departments are strained. You know we went from a uh, hundred casinos to over two thousand casinos in a in a short period of two decades and these departments are, 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 are struggling. So they can't be the end all be all, you know, and, and, and another thing too, that I find out when I've talked to some advantaged players is just like you talk, uh, you just said that you, you kept records and maybe they don't keep uh, as, as uh, precise records as you did, but I know these guys, they, they go out and they survey the properties before they try to attack them. And they see who's watching what or doing what. And what you'll find out 90% of the time, and I know people out there are going to say, well, no, that don't happen in my place. But people are task-oriented. So they go through the pit and they got a Title 31 or they got a, a, a CTR to write on something. Their total focus as they're walking through the pit is this document and going, they're not looking to the right. They're not looking to the left. They're not looking for other things on their way they're just a total, just focused on this. And it could be a jackpot. It could be, could be anything, but these pit managers, managers, they don't look around. They don't, they don't look behind them and around. And that's when you're going to spot something. Whoa, what, what did I just see? What, what did I just, you know, I always say when, <laughs> when I'm doing these trainings, I said, if a loaded Colt 45 was laying in the middle of the layout, right on the insurance line, would you see, would you even see it? You know, because I go into these casinos and you see limit signs that are uh, 
you know, like off or broken. And the players are playing on a game that doesn't even have a limit side, which in most jurisdiction is a violation of state state regulations. And stuff like that just just utterly amazing. They're just just not aware. So your your point, in fact, uh, of you know, it starts at it starts at the table with the dealer, the supervisor. That that that's key. But you know, does 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 people train that anymore? Speaking of training, let's 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 move on. Uh, I don't want to hold you up. I know you you got some tra uh, travel plans. So, Richard, you know you're now into uh, full bore into the uh, tr table games protection. You're on the, I don't know what is the uh, dark side or the good side, but you're on one of the sides now. And uh, so uh, you're you got a, a very successful table games uh, conference. Uh, what was th three years now? Or are we four years in? Three done, 22, 23, 24. The, the next one is in London uh, in November, and I will have an announcement on the the next one, which would be the fifth one, uh, the fourth in the United States. I will have an announcement about that where and when uh, next week. you got to be very excited about this one coming up in November because, I mean, that's going to happen six months from now. Uh, that's that You know how fast that goes. You've, you've been through this now, and I think, you know, when you did the first one, I kind of helped you uh, with uh, some of the planning stages, and you know how fast them timelines come up, and you got you got to be really getting your juices got to be getting uh, flowing about this uh, this uh, new uh, uh, conference in it's in London, is it not? Yes, yes, uh, yeah. I'm very I'm very excited about that. It's really the first time anybody has ever brought uh, this kind of a conference, you know, dealing with these topics. Uh, in, in all of Europe. And uh, it, it's, you know, surveillance is completely a different operation in the, especially in the UK versus the United States. Uh, they really don't have surveillance departments. They really have a lot. Uh, and, they, and they do very well because their table game staff are much more educated and much more on the lookout uh, to protect their tables right there. You know, they, they believe, you know, what you and I are talking about, you know, they believe that the game protection is all on the floor. And like you said, in the United States, especially uh, surveillance has, you know, their their scope of what they have to take care of is, is going like this. It's getting wider and wider and wider and they don't have time uh, and the manpower to to deal with only table games, you know, which is uh, and slot machines, which is what they were doing, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And like you said, the people on the floor who are so focused on one issue, right, whether it's the Title 31 or whatever, and, and they, their uh, perspective or view on game protection is going like this, and they're walking straight ahead, and they don't go right, and they don't go left. In, in the UK, they have 24 hour uh, video coverage. And when they see something on the floor, that's suspicious. They just go back and they look at their video. They don't have a surveillance department. They don't, most of them don't. And uh, it's not very publicized, but uh, this is the way it is. If they have a surveillance department, it might be a uh, uh, one or two people, but they, they take care of, they take care of their um, casinos. Uh, you know, they protect their games and their, and their machines on the floor and a great a great uh piece of evidence uh, to reflect that is the phil ivy case you know they where did it get caught you know they were they were beating the hell out of the united states casinos especially uh, in atlantic city right the borgata ivy and uh kelly's son and uh nobody knew what was going on and the scam was around before that five years before they did it there were some incidents in las vegas uh that i believe were talked about and uh so they went they went ahead they got it on in atlantic city and uh, they took it to london and boom first first shot they get caught so what you know these people in london they were aware uh, uh the table games people i'm not talking about them. they're just table games people they just saw something that didn't look right and they investigated it and they cracked the case you know here surveillance doesn't have time to to investigate everything and the table games people certainly don't have the desire. Uh, I, I shouldn't say in general, they don't have enough, uh, let's say, interest 
in, in the game protection sectors. You, the, you know, and you got to give, you got to excuse them. They're so busy with the, you know, with the customer service, the ratings, and and uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things in uh, mixed in now with table games. You got player development, so you know, game protection uh, keeps getting slimmer. And uh, and and another thing is saturation. Uh, uh, the saturation point that uh, you have talked about before where there's so many casinos now, there's so much saturation, there's so much attention to, uh, you know, I, I I remember, here here's a great example. I don't want to mention any names, but I remember um, somebody uh, speaking about the conference. I remember speaking to a, a surveillance director and uh, saying, you guys sending anybody to my conference? And he said, you know what? I really wish I could, but I can't because... Uh, I just lost half my uh, surveillance department to the Fountain Blue, hmm. um, uh, the, the new, you know, the, one of the newest casinos, uh, if not the newest casino right now. You know, it's behemoth. It's a monster in, in Las Vegas. And, you know, so what is surveillance? Uh, you know, and then, there's, you know, that brings up the shortage of, uh, of people. And now you get uh, a surveillance department that gets practically wiped out because people want to go work at the, at the Fountain Blue. So they, they just don't have time. You know, so it's uh, so many casinos and so uh, and, and, and so much movement now. You know, uh, an another big problem is that uh, there's not, you know, in, you know, every time you look on LinkedIn, you know, every day there's five people, you know, five high up uh, people in table games and surveillance. Uh, I'm happy to announce that I just started my job at, at, at this casino, da 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 da, right? Yeah. But you know what? Did, let's not forget they left the casino, yeah. and that casino has to replace them. Yeah. So you have this huge turnover of uh, of high level people, right? That's key. High level people. You know, there's always been huge turnovers. You know, with, with say dealers, and, but now you have high level people, and what the, what happens when you have a huge turnover of high level people? You know, policies don't get followed. Uh, uh, training is becomes less of an issue. So it, it's all, you know, it's all a a major uh, ensemble of, life, of, almost. of problems. <laughs> almost the circle of life of, uh, of yeah, casino, yeah. right? Uh, so I got to say, and, and I firmly believe this, not because I'm a gaming consultant or you're a gaming consultant or Bill Zender or, or Sal or who, whoever the, this person is a consultant. I believe if you spend that money, whatever it is, 6,000, 5,000, 3,000, whatever the number is, you're going to get 10 times that back in, in uh, uh, alleviated loss during that period until it fades, right? You, you should do training every year, some sort of uh, protection training. You're definitely going to get value out of that. And if you send somebody to a conference like yours or a conference like Willie's or whoever, you're going to get value out of that. You just you, you're just going to because you're going to increase the strength of that that right there on the floor, right in the combat zone. Uh, you know, them guys who are really going to see that thing and, and and be able to stop it. Right. Just even like I said, even if you save twenty five thousand in loss or thirty thousand, that, that, that's nothing compared to the minor cost of bringing in a consultant like you. Now, speaking of bringing in a consultant, now you, everybody's seen the banner sitting below Richard. That's the address where you can uh, go and uh, get a hold of Richard for, uh, I don't know how much time you got in between now and November, but I'm sure you got some uh, slots open. And uh, if you want to get Richard to uh, train your staff, uh, here he is. Here he is. You, you've got, you've heard it from the man himself. Richard, any, any final words for the uh, audience out there? I've got a few. Well, one of them is, don't miss these B and O episodes with Benny Mancino. Okay, you want to learn not just about game protection, but he covers everything. Just like I try to cover everything in game protection, he likes to cover everything in everything. And the second thing I want to say is, remember this. And I, I've been saying this for a lot of years now, and I'll probably be saying it until the day I die. The more the technology goes up. The, the less effective the people on the floor in game protection become because everybody's depending too much on the technology. And I always say, one last thing, I always say that people always ask me all the time, you know, they read about my what I did and all this, and they, they say, could you get away with that stuff today? 
and, and I say, I look them right in the eye or if it's a Zoom call or, a, or, what, or if it's a re written response, I say, I could make more money now by far than I ever did. You know why? Because that term social engineering, well, I never, in my case, I called it setup, but uh, by using psychological denomination, so people like me are would be able to completely nullify surveillance because surveillance cannot do anything really in real time unless they're alerted and uh, by table games people or if it's an issue in the in the slot department by slot uh, slot people and, and the bottom line is is that the people that need to be educated in game protection now more than anybody else is the table game staff not surveillance because surveillance is too busy with other things and game protection is just a small fraction of what they have to do. So that is all I have to say, Benny. Thank you very much for having me again. And uh, I love being in the be in the know. Uh, Richard, it's been great having you and uh, thank you for uh, uh, participating on this episode. And folks, uh, uh, Richard Richard stated, if, if you want to know anything about casinos, or or, or 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 table games. There's only one way. You got to be in the know. See you on the next one. Thanks for joining us.